Hey friends, welcome to Fertility q and I am rapid fire answering all of your fertility questions. I am Dr. Natalie Crawford. I am a board certified OBGYN and REI, and I am answering your questions from Instagram. I already did a part one to this video. Hopefully you watched it. This is part number two because I got all of these questions over on the Instagram and I tried to answer as many as I can, but I know that you're dying to learn more about your body. So I'm going to rapid fire answer more of them right now. What are your thoughts on transferring mosaic embryos? Oh, starting out with a good one. Okay. Think about an embryo. We do genetic testing on embryos at a stage called a blastocyst. A blastocyst is about 200 to 300 cells. Imagine it like a soccer ball. Inside the soccer ball is the actual part that becomes the baby called the inner cell mass, and the outside of the soccer ball is the trophectoderm or the placenta. When we do the biopsy, what we do is we take a sampling of cells from the outside, and then that sample is sent off to the lab. The lab that runs these chromosome samples actually analyzes each of the cells individually, and they're looking at chromosome number, or if the embryo is euploid or aneuploid. So you'll find out if a chromosome is missing or you have an extra one. This to us sounds like it should be a dichotomous outcome, normal or not normal, but what we actually know is that the placenta can sometimes be mosaic. Mosaic means that two different cell lines live inside that sample. So not every cell is the same. Some say normal, some say abnormal. You have low level mosaics where most of the cells say that the embryo is normal and you have high level mosaics where most of the cells say the embryo is abnormal. And those are gray zones on how to counsel somebody. The reality is that the embryo could be either of these. We think that during embryo development, it actually tries to push out some of the abnormal cells. I don't transfer high level mosaics. There have been reports of high level mosaics becoming a live born baby because you could have a normal embryo, but the rate is closer to three to 5%. I also don't discard them. I think the technology may get better. So that's something where I say, let's wait and see. Low level mosaics I have transferred with the caveat that we need to understand what we're doing. Transferring a low level mosaic is automatically going to put you in track to have genetic testing of your fetus. Meaning that when you're pregnant, you're gonna get an amniocentesis so they can look at the chromosomal complement of the actual baby. You can't do CVS because that's placental also. So you know you're gonna get high level genetic testing and then if it becomes abnormal, are you putting yourself in a hard spot depending on what the abnormality is to decide about termination, continuing the pregnancy or what it means. It does have a higher pregnancy rate than high level mosaics. So we think the pregnancy rate with low levels is closer to 25 to 30%, but not anywhere near a euploid embryo, which is closer to 70%. To me, those are last ditch effort embryos before you give up or you move on to donor eggs or something different. It's not a no, but if we have the opportunity, going to get more embryos is always going to be preferred. Ooh, that was a lot for question one. Can you address PCOS? Feel like I've tried everything and getting nowhere. Here's the reality. I'm really sick of PCOS being your fault. And that's what a lot of social media sites are trying to do. PCOS is a complex disease, stands for polycystic ovarian syndrome. I have lots of videos specifically designated talking about PCOS specifically. But what we need to know is that it is a disease where your ovaries are not responding to normal signals from the brain. Therefore, they do not ovulate. And instead of ovulating, they actually switch and they start making testosterone more. This then continues in a feedback loop. You get a lot of insulin resistance and it becomes a hard pattern to break. Think of this as like a genetic disease that you're born with. There's some environmental component, but not that you can just go and change it. And so what I see and that drives me crazy is people who blame or they carry a lot of guilt or stigma with PCOS or they do all the PCOS lifestyle stuff and they still don't ovulate and then they think something's wrong with them. There are patients who are thin, there are patients who are overweight, both can have PCOS. There are patients who can eat healthy, who don't eat healthy, both can have PCOS. I like to think of it as a teeter-totter. You're never gonna cure your PCOS. The goal is to control it and to control your symptoms the best. The lifestyle things that can help are often the things that kind of help lower testosterone or help kind of reverse some of the extra estrogen that your body may have. So always losing weight if you're overweight, Fat cells make estrogen, losing weight is going to lower that estrogen burden, release the brain from a little bit of suppression and increase sensitivity. So losing weight is going to be helpful. If you have any signs of insulin resistance, taking medications like metformin can be helpful. That helps impair the insulin resistance. And we do see some women ovulate just with metformin alone. 
other lifestyle-based factors. Having a diet that's higher in plants than in animal products for your protein has been shown to be more ovulatory. We also see that avoiding processed foods and sugars can be advantageous. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I also recommend all my PCOS patients avoid toxins. Supplements like vitamin D, a prenatal vitamin that has folic acid in it, and consideration for inositol may be helpful for some people. Always talk to your doctor, but please stop blaming yourself if you have PCOS. Eight weeks pregnant, dark brown spotting in the last five to seven days. Should I be concerned? You should always have some concern when you're bleeding in pregnancy. And the answer to this question is one, please tell your doctor. Hopefully you've already told your doctor by now. If a pregnancy has already been documented in the uterus, it's a lot less concerning than if you've never gone in for that first visit. If you've never gone in, what we worry about with vaginal bleeding, could this be a miscarriage in process? Could this be an ectopic pregnancy and you're having uterine bleeding with it? So if you have not seen your doctor, you've not had an ultrasound that shows a baby inside the uterus, that is going to be step number one. Presumably, if that's already happened and you know you have an intrauterine pregnancy and you have spotting, some of those spotting can be really normal and we get really worked up about it understandably, but it can be simply from the cervix. You can see cervical bleeding. It can be from activity. It can be from the placenta growing in or subchorionic hematoma. That's one of the most common things that we see. And I like to think of that as as that placenta grows into your uterus, it has little proteases that are eating away at your own blood supply and then the placenta has to attach in. And think of that bleeding like one little blood vessel kind of escaped and little blood came out. So that's not concerning as long as it stops. With enough time, that placenta should grow all the way in and you'll be fine. We do usually put patients on pelvic rest, so no intercourse, no nothing in the vagina, no heavy exercise, just because I like to think of it, we don't want to rub that scab off. We want to really try to close the gap as best as possible. Most of the time, bleeding is no big deal but you always want to let your doctor know so we can check it out. Thoughts on seed cycling. I have a lot of thoughts on seed cycling. It is not a real thing. It's not a real thing that you need different nutrients at parts of your cycle. It was notably created by somebody who wants to sell you products, sell you supplements, sell you seeds, sell you a plan. That person's even admitted the fact that it was made up and that she just wanted to create something to offer people the different phases of their cycle. In my mind, it's more predatory. It's making you obsess over things that don't matter as much. Are eating seeds bad for you? No, I'm a vegan. I love seeds. So is it going to hurt you in any way? No, but I hate seeing women spend lots of money on things that are not proven to help them and then have a lot of hesitation to come in and get tested and evaluated for things that can regularly help. So I am not a fan of seed cycling. There's no evidence to support it. And I think it's predatory. Real talk with Nat. What are your thoughts at at-home fertility kits like Modern Fertility? I get asked about Modern almost every day. So let's say, I don't my rant today. Okay, Modern, in general, I love the idea. I like their CEO. I like the reason they created it. I believe in anything that improves access to care. I have patients who find me because they used an at-home fertility test. Fan of all of those things. What I am also not a fan of though is predatory marketing towards people who might scare them from coming into my office. So if you use an at-home fertility test because you're just curious and want to test your fertility and you find out your values are low, therefore you want to schedule an appointment with me and talk about egg freezing, that's an amazing use of the test. So I love it for that. I understand that some people aren't going to schedule an appointment or they may not without that data and that that is improving a barrier to care. So I'm a fan. I don't like the idea that it's going to save you money or that it's going to be more affordable because that's a blanket statement and it also presumes that coming into my office is extremely expensive. The truth is that every patient has a different level. Most of my patients have coverage, insurance coverage for fertility testing, meaning that you can come in and I can talk to you and do an ultrasound and order all the same blood and you'll pay a copay, $30, $60, depending on your plan, that's way less than the test. And so to some people who maybe have no benefits or no coverage, yeah, it could be cheaper, but to presume the fact that I'm too expensive to give my opinion to somebody is really putting a lot of bias in people's minds that fertility care is expensive and it's not for everyone. It can be. Definitely, I wish we had universal coverage. I wish we had mandated care. I live in Texas and we don't. So my short answer is that I love anything that approves accessibility. If you're never gonna come into my office, but you'll do an at-home finger prick test, and then if you get abnormal results, you might come in, I'm a fan of that. 
I want you to know that you should call a local fertility clinic because sometimes we're actually more affordable than even tests like that. And we can always interpret the information better as far as talking about your goals, what you want, when you're ready, do an ultrasound and give you the best information possible. Thank you guys so much. Fertility q and I am answering your questions for National Infertility Awareness Week. As always, I hope you subscribe to the channel and follow along for more videos. And there's more educational information on the As Woman podcast. Thank you.